Hi, everybody. All right, so hi, everyone. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for Friday, August 16th, 2013. This week, I have a list. All right, this week, we're going to be talking about Area 51 unclassified. Uh, the IOU naming policy has been changed. The Hyperloop has been described by Elon Musk. Uh, the space fence shut down. Uh, a new discovery of a Nova. Uh, in, sort of update on the Kepler mission. Uh, a magnetar found near the Galactic Center. And a cool trip to the Sudan Mine Neutrino Observatory. So this week, joining me, as you can see them all here, we've got Brian Koberlein from Rochester Institute of Technology. Brian, welcome back. Number two. We didn't scare you off the first time. No. <laughs> well, then I will I will endeavor to scare you off this time. Uh, we've got uh, okay. David. <laughs> David Dickinson. Hey, hey. Dependable David Dickinson. Enjoying the, the heat and the clouds down here in Florida, as always. <laughs> uh, in the summer in Florida. I can't even imagine what the summer in Florida would feel like. I literally can't imagine. Um, it's just humid. It's just humid all the time. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Uh, no, because like winter there, I was, I've been there in like January and December, it, and I It's not bad in January. It. it does cool off a little bit in January. Yeah. yeah. That's good stargazing uh, time. <laughs> um, right, and uh, and what's your little tagline today? You save space fence. We're saving fa space fence. Uh, we've got Nancy Atkinson, my uh, Hi. the senior editor at Universe Today. That's a great website. Yeah, it is, isn't it? It's good to see you back, Nancy. I know you, we, yeah. we always keep you so busy that uh, you you don't have a lot of time to come and join us in the space hangout. But but you got some big news today, so I think that's great. Okay. And Nicole Gallucci from CosmoQuest, a.k.a. The Noisy Astronomer. Hello. And so you're now back. You're sort of in the office. You're not traveling anywhere, being the the mini <laughs> Pamela, having to <laughs> travel the world. Actually, you're going to be at DragonCon, right? Not till DragonCon, yeah. So, yeah, yeah I've had uh, all of August to be here and not on a plane, which is lovely. And I'm actually getting work done, which is great. <laughs> Different kind of work than going to conferences, so... Yeah. Okay, so let's take a look at the stories. Oh, you just shared some resources at me. Thank you. Okay, Thank uh, you. let's take a look at the stories. Oh, what do I want to talk about first? I want to talk about Area 51. <laughs> 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 so this is great. So, I mean, this was a total surprise. I was not expecting this, and we sort of came across this story this morning, and Nancy, you moved quickly and, and got on this. So what's the story? Well, in this uh, new document that was released by the CIA, it's, it's a big one. It's 355 pages, and, and actually when I was looking at it and, and uh, you know, getting ready to write the story, I kind of got distracted by reading it because it it's really interesting. Uh, but what it, within the document, um, they, the CIA officially acknowledges that Area 51 does exist. They also come clean about uh, that, yes, the weather balloons wa was a cover story. Um, so, but, you know, much to everyone's dismay. Aliens? No, Come on, we no, want to know about the yeah. aliens. No alien bodies or, or uh, extraterrestrial craft are hidden at the base, sorry. Uh, it's, it's all kind of mimeographed uh, pages, and so they've got some maps in there and uh, some other documents, but most of them are, are kind of just really grainy and, and you really can't see them. Uh, but anyway, what they do reveal is that Area 51 was uh, an area for test flights for the U-2 and uh, Project Oxcart, which was uh, aerial reconnaissance over the Soviet Union and, and other areas of the world. So that, that's not too big of a surprise. Um, but they talk about uh, all sorts of, there's a lot of military history, and uh, for, so if anybody who's a military history buff will enjoy reading this. Um, something interesting that uh, that was revealed that I thought was interesting in any way was that President Eisenhower wanted the pilots of the U-2 to be non-U.S. citizens so that if it did crash mm -hmm. in a, in a you know some location that they could uh, it would be really easy to deny that the United States was part of this. <laughs> so um, they would have they would be in some a U.S. aircraft. <laughs> with a U.S. uniform, but they happen to have <laughs> German citizenship. Right. 
Yeah. So I, I I knew in my uh, in my Air Force days I knew guys that worked out there when the 117 was a black project that worked on that project out there. It wasn't really mysterious that we all always knew Area 51 was there. Mm-hmm. I never got to yeah. go there myself, but. Yeah, yeah. So it, I mean, like I said, it, it's really interesting. Uh, but they did talk about how uh, when they started doing the test flights, that that led into this huge jump in reports of UFOs, and and they kind of explained how that happened because of the of how fly, high the the U2s were able to fly, like about sixty thousand feet, and uh, you know regular standard aircraft flew between um, ten and twenty thousand feet. Uh, and their other military aircraft flew about 40,000 feet. And so you had even these you know, seasoned military pilots were reporting they're seeing UFOs. And it's just because of, you know, they could be in darkness, but the U-2 could be up in the sunlight and glinting. And this created kind of a fiery uh, scene that, that uh, people were seeing, you know, even in the air and on the ground as well. And so uh, they talked about... Um, uh, Project Blue Book, which you know, that's if you're if you read about UFO conspiracy theories, I mean, Project Blue Book is huge because. Uh, uh, but what they were really doing was they were looking at the the UFO reports and then trying to line them up with actual U2 flights, and uh, so they were trying to um, uh, you know take those and corroborate them and then trying to make those UFO sightings not happen, you know, uh, have the flights be in a different area that people wouldn't see them and that kind of thing. So it, it's really interesting reading. You can you can read my article on Universe Today. It's it's really fun, <laughs> actually. Yeah, well, you, you pulled out specifically a lot of the stuff just on the UFOs and tried to sort of cover that. So I think that, you know, for yeah. the for the space fans out there, they're going to get a lot of value out of it just because it covers all of the parts, but also just the high-altitude tests and flights and things like that. But but it sounds great. So, okay, so let's, let's hear from the panel here. Do you folks think that this is going to shut down all of the UFO conspiracy theorists? No. Not, not really, no. <laughs> Definitely not all of it. I, I okay. was curious. Is it going to do anything? <laughs> or is it going to fire them up worse? No, we oh. know this is a cover-up for the real truth. <laughs> yeah, there's no say, end to the uh, level of conspiracy if, that could be added. You, if you're saying the, they were saying the weather balloons were a cover, did they say a cover for anything specific or, or like for when there was for when there was debris, okay. any type of debris? Okay. Yeah, I, oh, I, and I also know, they were basically spy aircraft. I, I right? know, I know. When the case of like the F-117, they deliberately leaked things like the remember the F-19 Ghost Rider was never a real aircraft, but they leaked it out there to kind of. Uh, put the, the Ruskies off our trail of what we were really doing when the 117 was covered up. So I know yeah. they did those kind of things. And they did say that that, that cover story had disastrous effects uh, because in 1960 when uh, the pilot crashed in, in the USSR, um, yeah, and they, well, hard. initially they didn't know what happened to the plane or the pilot, and so they had the CIA actually had NASA release a statement that uh, they had a, a weather plane that the pilot lost oxygen and passed out and and that's why the plane uh, drifted into USSR airspace and then within just a couple of days uh, Nikita Khrushchev revealed you know was standing there with a picture of the crashed mm-hmm. airplane debris and then they had the pilot who had admitted that he uh, he was spying so I mean that was uh, uh, cover story that quickly went wrong. Well, that's does, cool. Does anyone remember the old Project Blue Book TV series from the 70s? No. Oh, no. I, there's bits of it on YouTube you can actually find. It was kind of a forerunner to the X-Files. It was a drama. <laughs> oh, that's but it was great. Yeah. I have to look at that. There's yeah. tons of really great old stuff on, on YouTube. Yeah. I've been going through uh, old James Burke documentaries on YouTube. Yeah. Like the day the universe changed and connections and oh, that's so good. Uh, <clears throat> okay, well let's move on. Okay, so the next thing that is going to get me really excited is we're going to talk about the Hyperloop, uh, and this is great. So if people aren't aware, this is this uh, advanced uh, transportation system that had been developed by uh, by Elon Musk of SpaceX fame, and obviously we're super fans of uh, of SpaceX and all the stuff that's going on there. So this is totally in our wheelhouse. So so Brian, you've been following the uh, the Hyperloop. I've been uh, yeah I've been following it a bit. I mean it's 
this is one of those dream big ideas. And, you know, it, it kind of follows a slightly different approach because we know of the high speed rails that are like magnetically levitating. So the idea is get rid of the rails, <clears throat> lose the friction, levitate them magnetically, and then accelerate them magnetically. So you can get to high speeds, not a whole lot of energy loss. The one big problem with maglev trains is air resistance. So you can streamline to a point, but there's, there's kind of a limit to how fast you can go. So, you know, on the other side of it, there's always been the kind of evacuate all the air out of a tube and then just push things down and evacuate it too. And this is kind of a compromise. It is um, reduce the pressure, don't try and make a hard vacuum, but reduce the pressure so you will lose some of the air resistance. And then use the air that remains to levitate instead of magnets. So it's basically got this huge uh, motor on the front that sucks in air, compresses it, and then shunts it underneath the, um, the Hyperloop train to use that to support it. Um, and, you know, it's supposed to be high speed. It's supposed to be relatively easy to construct. You know, it's one of those things that might be possible at some point, but engineering-wise, there's still a lot of things to go. But, I, I mean, you're a physicist by training. Uh, I mean, does it feel like he's, by having this lower pressure system where the the car itself, the train cars itself, is what's actually compressing the air and, and moving it between the front and the back and using it for cushioning, right. that feels, that does feel a little novel. I, I you know, I follow this yep. kind of stuff all the time, and I can't think of a time when someone has has put all that into the vehicle as opposed to make it part of the tube, make it the tracks, make it whatever. That that does seem like a fairly clever uh, solution to the problem. It, it is a novel design, and and I think it's probably... I mean, just looking at the technical specs, you know, Musk is a smart guy. So what he's proposing is kind of in the realm of going to the moon in the mid-50s. You know, everything that you could propose is somewhat reasonable. There are technical challenges that still have to be overcome. It's going to be modified. But I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility, but it's also not going to happen in five years. But, I mean, he compares this to this gigantic train infrastructure that's being developed, have this high-speed rail between Los Angeles and San Francisco, and I think the price tag on that is like $60 billion, and he thinks he can do it for a fraction of that cost at a higher price, where the ticket prices are $20, and, 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 you know, and... Yeah. Is he... And, and that's where, I mean, it feels like he's moving into... Not fantasy land, but just um, optimistic thinking gone amok. But he yeah, I, I he has also felt that way about electric cars, and he's felt that way about about private rocket systems, and he's delivering. Yes, I mean, I I think given who he is and given his background, it's worth listening to. I had um, heard I had heard Musk wasn't going to fund this himself. He said he was kind of throwing the design out there, hoping somebody would run with it. Right. I think he's changed now and said that he'll at least be willing to work on the kind of beta testing of it. I think that that that's sort you know he, often when you're like an entrepreneur like that and you come up with these big ideas, you know, there's a real value to get those ideas out there and get people kind of crunching on them and trying to tackle them. And I think in his mind, he would just love for this thing to exist. If someone did come along and just say, "Yes, I'll build it." Done. This is a great idea. Yeah, we'd never thought of putting this into the cars, and that's, that's great. We'll do it. We'll implement it right away. But he knows that nobody will, that right. they will be like, what about the earthquakes? And, you know, they'll, <laughs> they'll, they'll complain in all kinds of different ways, and, and they'll, and they'll poo-poo it. And then, and then when he just goes, it goes, fine, I will build it, and then I'll make money from it. And now you're all sad. I think that's, I think that's the way he's, he, he's probably going to handle this, right? Which is that he, if he has the money and he can develop it, and he's sure that the economics work out, work out, then if no one else is going to do it, he's going to do it, and then he's going to rake in the money, and everyone's going to complain about it. But they had their chance. Yeah, I think I think if he was able to do a short track that um, met with what his standards are in terms of how he's describing it, if he could make a, a short track that actually works, I think you'd find a lot more attention being paid to it. 
on, on a serious level, on a government level. I mean, even um, a cargo system, right? You could imagine some kind of just a cargo train that could go between those two locations would have be of tremendous value for for transporting really high speed types of things. So, yeah, I think that's where it has kind of more um, potential, at least early on. Yeah, and I, one, I, one of the things that he has as a weak point is um, there's a thing called lateral G. That if you're on a high speed train, when you take a curve you get pulled to the side because of the centripetal acceleration. And if he's talking about going you know, 700 miles an hour, the level of curves that he's talking about are going to have large accelerations laterally. Um, I think there was a calculation that was about seven times, eight times what the high-speed rail does. That's not comfortable. You know? And then given the design that you're in a two-seater that's only two meters wide, and you're sitting there for 30 minutes like a roller coaster. That's that's something to be overcome. I mean, you know, if you're 20, you might go, oh yeah, that's cool. But if you're 60, <laughs> not if you got a bad back. No. Is yeah, it you less got a bad back. comfortable <laughs> than an intercontinental flight now? <laughs> but an intercontinental flight is mostly it's mostly comfortable, and every now and then you go through some turbulence. But I think, as, no, as no, Brian no, is you, saying, you more to the comfort level of the flight than the, the turbulence. There's sure, the but I mean, you, just imagine you're, you're there's no help. Like it's not like the the steward is going to walk by and and make sure your back is comfortable. You're locked into a little tube, and once they shut the door and you're off. There's no, there's no stopping it. There's no taking yeah. a break. There's no saying, well, you know what? I find this a little uncomfortable. You're <laughs> you're strapped in. It's like a roller coaster. Exactly. I think Brian hit it exactly yeah. right, which is that you're. It's it is like you get on a roller coaster. It starts to go up that hill, and your chances to not do this are over. So, yeah, and I, I think it has potential. I do. I do think it has potential. He needs to prove a, a beta test of it. He has to prove feasibility before you can really start think, sinking some government money into it. And it's going to take that because it's going to be land acquisition and it's going to be you know, large-scale planning. It's not something like an electric car where he can build it, show that it works, and then build the infrastructure mm -hmm. with electric charging stations. He has to co-op land. Land is going to have to be taken to do this. But you can imagine another country doing it, like Japan or Germany, who... Yeah, I mean, who, I can imagine the United or States. Or China, doing. even. Right? This is the kind of thing that they might jump on and go, yeah, you you can't ac acquire the land, but we sure can. Well, yeah. <laughs> if they've demonstrated their ability to do that. We, we were supposed to be traveling in pneumatic tubes by 2013 anyway. We just need jetpacks now and we're set. I just want my hoverboard. There you go. <laughs> That's true, because wasn't that movie around 2014 or 2015? It's 2015, anyway? I think, yeah. Yeah, so hoverboards. They've got a year. Yeah, yeah I need my hoverboards. Need to, yeah, they need to get on that. All I'm right. happy with my Jetsons moving sidewalk in there. <laughs> okay, okay so, uh, I just want to quickly do two votes here. Okay, number one, would you ride in the Hyperloop? Everyone yeah. put up their hand. Who would oh, ride yeah. in the Hyperloop? So we all would ride the Hyperloop. Okay. <laughs> yes. Who thinks the Hyperloop will actually happen within our lifetime? Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Moving I'll, on. I'll put it. I'll put it at about forty percent. <laughs> okay. No, no. I need. It was a binary question. Okay. Oh, I'm gonna binary. move on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, let's talk about the space fence and and its shutdown, which is the yes. uh, which is your tagline today, David. It, it's it's not shut down yet, uh, and it's actually the system kind of informally known as space fence is actually the Air Force Space Surveillance System run by uh, Air Force Space Command. They're not renewing the fifth uh, year of contract on it, so that means that it's by October first at the beginning of the physical year it's most likely going to be mothballed. And what Space Fence is, is a series of VHF receivers that are strung out over the southern United States over 30 degrees north. And they passively ping everything that passes over. Uh, space junk, satellites, they're, they've been the backbone of our satellite tracking since 1961. So it's, it's an older system and a newer system, the official Space Fence is supposed to go online, but that might be years down the road right now. They, they are going to have some capability, but right uh, up to this, this point, historically, we've used Space Fence for about 40% of our tracking capability. So we're going to be losing some of that, and this is all due to sequestration, incidentally. In the Air Force press release, they were talking about how they're looking at the long term if they have to cut uh, up toward, I think, 150 to even the DOD's talking about cuts as high as $500 billion over the next 10 years. 
uh, those kind of cuts they're going to definitely have to look at a lot of, and there's some military programs that are redundant, but it's kind of sad to see this one go. Um, in the interim, they are going to use trackers that are based in North Dakota and Eglin Air Force Base in Florida, so we're not losing our capability entirely. But with the amount of space junk and the amount of uh, debris that's escalating up there, I mean, there was the Iridium Cosmos collision in 2009 that spread debris. There was a Chinese anti-satellite test in 2007. And Space Fence, incidentally, was on hand to track all those, too, as that spread debris. Uh, I, read, I wrote an article a few weeks ago about it was a satellite, a CubeSat they launched out of Ecuador that they lost due to, uh, they think it was collision with space junk, uh, only a month or two after it, it had been launched. So this is a growing problem, and it's kind of too bad to see this asset going to the wayside right now. Well, there's this, this concept, this theory that you might get this situation, this critical point where there's so much space junk up there yeah. that it's impacted with each other, uh, and it just turns into this shrieking hail of metal that surrounds the planet and yeah. acts like our, we've built our own shield that stops it's us from It's what's called a, an ablation cascade. Yeah, there's that worry out there that one collision may shower out millions more particles of debris those will hit more satellites, you know, and it will just cascade away. And the International Space Station is a big target. They have to move that. I, I track uh, when they do the debris avoidance maneuvers. They have uh, unscheduled ones where, they, where there's debris conjunctions, and they have to boost it using the Soyuz boosters or anything that's attached to it, like the ATV, HTV modules, things like that. But when they, they have to do that once or twice a month, they're moving the, the ISS to different orbits. And there's been a few times, I think at least three times, that the astronauts have had to sit in their Soyuz capsules uh, ready to evacuate just because they didn't know how close uh, predicted uh, debris conjunction was going to be. They can be out of the ISS in about 30 minutes if they really have to. They can be in there, but that would be a strange thing to wake up and just find out that the ISS had been abandoned. But it's a reality. It could happen. Uh, maybe this is a a uh, solution to the Fermi paradox that the reason there's <laughs> yeah. no aliens is because every one of them has... Mm. Uh, so, uh, uh, give me that term again. Uh, ablation... Uh, ab ablation cascade. I'm ablation. adding that to my Fermi paradox talk. Ablation that's, that's, cascade. Yeah. You know, that's one I've never seen before as a solution for the yeah. Fermi paradox. So. That's why I love it. Well, you know, you know, even if, if we put enough debris up there, even if we stopped doing it, if enough of it had collided, we might put a nice artificial ring around the Earth given, you know, a few thousand years. There are satellites up there from, oh, the early Vanguards are still up there. I was surprised. A, a friend of mine that tracks satellites pointed me to that. Vanguard 1, 2, and 3 are still up there in orbit from 59, I think they launched. Mm -hmm. They're some of the oldest things up there, but they're still in orbit right now. Wow. Uh, okay, well, we're going to move on, and we're going to talk about a magnetar found near the Galactic Center with Nicole. Yay! I thought this was pretty exciting. Um, so uh, a, an X-ray flare was discovered by the Swift spacecraft, which is our uh, workhorse of, of gamma ray and X-ray bursts, things that go boom in the night. Um, and it picked this one up, and it was followed up with the X-ray telescope New Star, and they discovered that this X-ray source, which was right near the galactic center, was pulsing. So it was going beep, beep, beep every, you know, four seconds or so. Uh, they, they tracked it down with several radio telescopes. So they used the 100 meter in Effelsberg, um, which has been used for decades to look for pulsars near the galactic center but had yet to find one. And so it was a big deal. They found it with Effelsberg. They observed it with the Very Large Array. Um, they observed it with a bunch of different radio telescopes and uh, measured this pulsar really accurately. So this pulsar, or this magnetar, uh, it's, a, it's a highly magnetized pulsar. Pulsar is a neutron star, which is a very dense object. It's got, you know, lighthouse beams coming out of, you know, each pole uh, from some kind of activity, and it's rotating. It's rotating rapidly. Uh, this was the, the period of this one, I think, was for at least an X-ray was uh, less than four seconds. Um, and so the, the beam sweeps through our field of view. Uh, and so by tracking this pulsar, and looking at it very close to the galactic center, we can figure out something about how the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy feeds on material. So one way, one thing that's been missing from this is the magnetic fields around the black hole. So we can measure the magnetic field along the line of sight to the black hole, but not the stuff that's a little bit of ways around it, and so the gas around it. And so using this pulsar, they used a, a method called uh, looking at the Faraday rotation measure. And I'll put the link in there that it explains the whole thing, but 
basically um, the polarized light from the pulsar. So it comes in at a preferential angle and it gets rotated through the magnetic field. And you can pick up that difference by um, wavelength or frequency that you set your telescope to. So by looking at all these different wavelengths, they figured out how much the electric field of the light, the polarization, had rotated through that, through that material and actually uh, measured the magnetic field. And it's only a few millionths of a gauss and the magnetic field on the surface of the Earth, for example, is about half a gauss. Um, so this is pretty exciting. They've been looking for decades for a pulsar near the galactic center just so they could do this measurement. They finally got one. Uh, it turns out to be a magnetar, which is a really rare type of pulsar. And so uh, they're going to be looking even harder now because if the chances of them finding a magnetar close to the galactic center are small, uh, chances are there are other pulsars pretty close by that they can use for this. So pulsar, supermassive black hole, right next door to each other. Very cool science. Awesome. Uh, is, so is that one of the situations where you're hoping to find something and it ended up being the best possible outcome? <laughs> I don't know if it made much of a difference, the fact that it was a magnetar, to, to doing the magnetic field rotation measurements. Um, the, the rotation measurement, me rotation measure measurements, that's a terrible phrase. <laughs> um, <laughs> to, but uh, I don't know if it makes a difference, but it is weird enough to make them think, well, there must be some others in, in the region. Uh, so a couple of comments have come in here. Um, so, so just for you, Nicole, mm -hmm. Serial Gaming TV says add the Reapers to your list of the Fermi paradox. And if you don't know what the Reapers are, then you should play Mass Effect. <laughs> okay, I don't. I'm sorry, I'm not a gamer type. I Doesn't ask matter. My boyfriend, what that means? Play Mass Effect. <laughs> okay. With your boyfriend, play it together. <laughs> Mass Effect, in, and I don't want to explain it because right. I don't want to ruin it. But essentially, the solution to the Fermi paradox described in Mass Effect <laughs> is one of the best. Uh, described in science fiction and media. It's terrific. I, awesome. I, I, I think I think once the aliens invent holodecks that they're just not interested in reality yeah. anymore is my theory. And a very similar version of that is the rates in, uh, in Stargate Atlantis, but not done as well as the Reapers. So, anyway. Okay. Um, that one I know. <laughs> Paul Gracie says, think of bobsleds with air instead of locally melted oh, ice. Oh, there's, 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 there's one before that, talking about the lateral acceleration on the yeah, hyperloop. No, I'm just going backwards. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah, oh, I see. So Paul says, yeah, lateral acceleration is not the issue. Is this will bank the same way the jetliners do in turns. Acceleration will be vertical. So so this is that situation, I guess, that you know, as, the, as, the, as you go around a big corner you're going to get pushed into the side of your vehicle and then you're going to come back over. But it's that's not the one that I think people are going to have a problem with. It's going to be those bumps when it's just a slight rise over the course <laughs> of 10 miles where you just kind of go, oh. Yeah, high G in any direction can't <laughs> yeah. be comfortable. But that's the worst one. That's the one that brings up lunch, right? <laughs> I was so, thinking more bladder spillage, but yeah. sure, that too. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, but Sylvan for itself. <laughs> Sylvan Westby says that China has already built the Simmons Maglev with German technology that Germans did not manage to build for 25 years. So I think that's a great point, right? Which is that the Chinese said that was a great idea. Maglev train, come on, get on with the Maglev. Okay, fine, we'll build it. You know, if you're gonna get all political about it, we we can absolutely, you know, <laughs> kick people off land and yeah, they built the Three Gorges <laughs> Dam. They could. They can demonstrate their ability to to not really worry about politics. I'm not saying this is a good thing. I'm just saying <laughs> this is a thing that they they have been known to do. Um, uh, Guido just asked, uh, can you see the rotating effect of a pulsar with the naked eye? Telescopes allowed. Well, the pulsations are usually in radio and in X-ray. Um, so you need those. It, it's not so much an optical light that's pulsing. Uh, is there any radio. correlation, though, between the optical light and the and the... Radio emissions? Um, I don't think Grab so. Nebula pulsar pulse is invisible. It does pulse invisible? Okay. Yeah. So there. But uh, it's, it's right not right. really bright enough to, to see. N Nicole, yeah, what was yeah. what, what was the, the physical separation? Maybe you said it before, the magnetar from the, from the I wonder if they have a light year? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So they're not they're not gonna generate a lot of gravity waves or anything like not that. Not yet. No, yeah. They're not merging or anything. No. Not that no, cool. no, no. But just just to where it's you know that gas stream that's feeding into the black hole is starting pretty much. Cool. That's super close. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. really close to the to the supermassive black hole. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on. Let's talk about the IAU's update to their naming policy. Nancy, 
Okay. Well, kind of not a surprise and kind of a surprise. Uh, this week the International Astronomical Union issued their statement that uh, they have changed their official stance on allowing the public to be involved in the naming of exoplanets. The statement was a little weird in that they didn't come out right away and say, okay, we decided we're going to name exoplanets because prior to this, their kind of their stance on exoplanets was there's going to be so many of them that we're not going to be able to name them. Uh, but then um, earlier this year, they kind of acknowledged, okay, the public is really interested in this and uh, perhaps you know, we might need to rethink this. And this came about because there were two different contests about, ex about um, one was naming exoplanets and the other one was naming the new moons of Pluto. And they were wildly uh, popular with the public. I mean, we had the one, the Pluto names, uh, was it William Shatner and uh, somebody yeah. else, who else was it? Uh, Buzz Aldrin, they were kind of competing of, of what the name should be and it was, you know, I think I even saw it on the, on the nightly news which was incredible. And then uh, Wingu had the exoplanet naming contest and the IAU got kind of um, upset about the uh, Wingu contest because they were charging funds and uh, it put out a statement that, you know, even if there was a, a clear winner uh, that they weren't going to uh, acknowledge that because there was funds involved and money making and that kind of thing. Um, so um, this week they put out a statement saying that uh, you know the public has been naming things for years and or, you know since uh, the beginning of of humanity basically and that um, the IAU um, really wants to acknowledge that there's an increasing interest by the public in uh, being involved with the discoveries. And so my understanding is that the IAU doesn't take um, public suggestions for any other names. Is that true? Stars? Anything? Does anybody know? They take comets. You can, you can, not for the public, but if you discover the comet, obviously you get to name it. Yeah. And mm -hmm. if you discover asteroids, you can propose names to the to the IAU, and they can they can ratify mm -hmm. them. Same thing with uh, Kuiper Belt objects, things like that. And that's what you know, uh, Mike Brown and his team did. I know technically all the names like Sirius and Aldebaran, they're more cultural names. They're not officially right. IAU names. Yeah. yeah, so all of those names, they're either cultural, like they're Arabic names, or yeah. um, or some of the stuff that was done in the last couple of hundred years as well. So there's some famous astronomers in the last few hundred years, and those have got, had names. But all of the stars, they all come from these catalogs, the Guide Star Catalog, yeah. the e Glides Catalog... Yeah, and, and they're all just Alpha numbers. Libri or something like yeah. yeah. So that each star has about yeah. half a dozen different names. And then all so, the extra solar planets come from, as they're just letter designations tagged onto the end of the star designation. So you're going to get Gliese 67D, and that's uh -huh. a planet. Yeah, or Tau so, Booby. Tau Booby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or Seti Alpha. So, Alpha planet. So Alpha I do five. think. So I do think that this decision now, or this statement that they put out, is a departure from from anything they've done before and so um, what I've said in the past about in articles about this is that when the IAU said that there's going to be so many that they won't be able to find names for them all and here we had Wingo and other um, entities running contests to then all these names were being submitted it's like well here's here's the names you know why not use them so I think they're they're kind of taking that into account and um, they are providing a uh, uh, an email address where people can send in names that they that they um, want to suggest, and then that also that um, that these naming campaigns or contests, if they are correctly sanctioned, then they get permission from the IAU to hold them. That the IAU will consider and um, and to use those names. Now they do have a whole list of rules. Um, you know, don't use your um, your pet's name or uh, uh, one one other rule was that they uh, discouraged military names and military procedures and that kind of thing. And then there was kind of a joke on Twitter: "Well, are we going to have to rename Mars because you know it's the god of war?" So, um, uh, but anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, 
so it, it's kind of interesting to see how this is going to play out. And of course, uh, a lot of people were were encouraged. Uh, I talked to um, Professor Abel Mendez, who's with the Planetary Habib Habitability Laboratory at uh, uh, Arecibo, and he was great. He he thought it was a great move, and that um, uh, you know it it bodes well for the future as far as the public being involved. Um, I also talked to Alan Stern from Owingo and he was not as excited. Uh, there is a provision mm -hmm. that they listed there that any um, you know type of money making project uh, would not be sanctioned and uh, and then Alan suggested to me well uh, what about publications like you know uh, astronomy magazines or even websites like Universe Today that that uh, uh, generate uh, generate money because of the content that we're selling. But uh, you know, and and we're not on the IAU's blacklist. So uh, it's it's still a debate that's open. It's it's interesting that the IAU has. Um, uh, you know, kind of changed, did an about face on this. So uh, um, I think it's it's great that they allow the public to be involved in this, and we'll just see how it turns out. What do you think about stars as well? I mean, this is the this is the big controversy, right? There's all these companies that attempt to sell mm -hmm. the names of stars, say. and and in many cases, the the problem is is that the IAU won't ratify these names. Well, that's not the problem. <laughs> the problem is that these people, these companies exist at all, and they they are saying that they can sell these star names. But why not? allow people to name stars. I mean, there are nine million stars in the Guide Star catalog. You could absolutely, you know, keep going down that list and name all kinds of things. You've got to pay you know, some person to well, keep that yeah. database, right? I mean, Right, and so not why not take a, an administration <laughs> fee, you know, if yeah. you're going to apply for the, to name the star and have that money go through the to go through the IEU, that's not necessarily a bad problem. I can see how well, Alan... Well, I mean, that was Wingo's point, was they were trying to raise money for re astronomy research and education. They're right. not and, just... Yeah, a yeah it wasn't just for... solely for profit. Well, right. I, absolutely, and I can see why Alan finds that really frustrating, but yeah. I think, I think he, for him, his argument needs to be... just needs to be tighter. He needs to say, we are raising money to discover extrasolar planets, and then... To, to raise that money, people are naming the extrasolar planets. And so we raised $10 million to name planets. That allows us to discover $10 million worth of extrasolar planets. When we finish naming those, we, we raise more money and we name more planets. And the two are inextricably linked. And as oh, soon yeah. as they're disconnected, <laughs> we're, we're selling the naming rights to planets. And over here, we're... we're raising money for, for astronomy and education, then I think it's the kind of thing that people are going to start to wonder what the, what the connection is. And I, I, I totally you know, believe that connection is there, but I think that's what it's going to take for people to really get there, behind it. There was a controversy uh, recently uh, with Mount Sharp 2 on Mars with the naming of Mount Sharp because uh, it was actually already named Aeolus Mons by the IAU was, uh, for the convention, so there was a lot of talk about whether they should be able to rename. It was named after a... Uh, Sharp was a famous uh, archaeologist, I believe, that they, yeah. they named it after on, when MSL landed. So Yeah, that, and that's, that's kind of been Alan's uh, argument as well, is that, okay, you have the um, technical names or the scientific names, and you also have the popular names, like, yeah. you know, uh, 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 oh, I can't forget the... Uh, Okay, any any mountain in the U.S. has has a name like Pikes Peak. Yeah. I mean, everybody knows that as Pikes Peak, and it, but there's also another name that it has. Um, so uh, you know, and all the the different um, things on Mars that the scientists have named those aren't official names, but that's what everybody refers to them as. And so uh, you know. Yeah, and I think, but I mean, let's use the example of a comet, right? If you go outside and you set up your telescope and you observe the night sky and you find a comet, then then they name the comet after you. And this is this direct correlation between you expending the resources to add this thing to the body of scientific knowledge. And that obviously, if you did, someone else would discover it four hours later, and and they would get the name. But but you can imagine some researcher who goes into the middle of the Brazilian rainforest and finds yeah. some new species of spider that was wholly unknown to science. Then the the very least that you could do is let them name it. 
Mm-hmm. I, I would argue, though, that ex- discovering exoplanets isn't an area of astronomy or astronomy education that necessarily needs the extra boost of funding. And so that's why it was more generally astronomy and education rather than just for discovering exoplanets, because there's already lots of, of projects and money going to that. But, but right, but I'm just saying, like, that's something... I mean, if you don't have a thing that you can name, if it's... then it's just a harder sell, that's all. Right? And we, we get it at star parties all the time where people want to see the, the star they named after a deceased loved one or a pet or things like that. Mm-hmm. It's, it, Generally, I just show it to them if they want, if they got the right ascension declination, if it's up and it's up. Now, if they ask me if there's anything to that star registry naming business, then I'll probably tell them more along the lines of you're better off saving your money. But you know, it's it, it happens. Mm-hmm. It's it's not an infrequent occurrence that star parties are doing public outreach at observatories. Now, what if the IAU did make it official, accepted money, and turned that money around, and like the Uingu model, I guess went into competition with Uingu? I'm sure <laughs> Alan wouldn't. I mean, that, I would if you know, if I was Alan, I would be a little concerned that that's the direction the IAU is starting to move. It's like, you know, they're going to start accepting fees to let people register star names, and where is that yeah, money going? They made it clear that there needs to be no exchange of revenue, right? So yeah, but once it costs the money, rules. and they're having to referee these things and make they're, decisions and handle the voting, someone's going to need to pay for all that. They're just going to up our membership fees. I'm not in the IAU yet, but they'll just yeah. up the membership fees for the IAU. It, it might be opening the floodgates because there's already been people selling land on the moon and land on Mars and crater names, and you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, it's it's tricky. I I think that just getting the public involved in the naming of space objects is awesome and exciting, and I think that's great. And I think I it's think complicated. We should go with Dex Luther's suggestion on YouTube, saying, "Shouldn't we be asking the people that live there what their planet is called?" <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good point. And so really, we should fund the uh, fund the more research. SETI. <laughs> yeah, fund more SETI. Fund the research to get out there and actually talk to those aliens and find out what they want to call their planet. I think that's a terrific suggestion. <laughs> um, all right, well, let's move on. Uh, okay, next up is the... Uh, well, Brian, why don't you talk about this? So you went and visited a neutrino observatory, and you were going to share some pictures, and that's awesome. I'm, I'm not sure how to bring up the pictures. You click screen share. We'll talk you through this. Okay. Find the picture, bring it up just in, like, the, are you using Windows or a Mac? It sounds I'm, like you're using a Mac. Okay, so your trackpad. I heard your trackpad. Share. Do the Don't hangout? The yeah. <laughs> well, tell you what. Uh, yeah, in the hangout, there's a there's a link that says screen share, and then you can bring up an image. Okay. Yeah. Now that's an image of me. Yeah. So you want the image? You want to, You want to click the? There you go. You can see it. There yeah. It is. Okay. Perfect. So, yeah, this is this is actually um, an iron mine in northern Minnesota. So it's about maybe an hour and a half north of Duluth. So if you know the state of Minnesota, it's up over the rim, so they get over Lake Superior, north of that. And it's near a town called uh, Tower Sudan. And it was a working iron man until the 60s. And because it's such high quality iron, it blocks a lot of the gamma rays that um, strike the Earth. So it's a good way to block out anything but neutrinos. And so, you know, it's over 2,000 feet down. Um, this is actually the detector itself. The, the interesting thing about this is that in order to get down into the mine, you've got a, a mine shaft with an elevator that's probably only about 10 feet wide. So like a hyperloop. And everything in the detector <laughs> had to be lowered through that mine shaft 10 feet wide. So little bit by little wow. bit. Um, and, and basically this uh, detector here is uh, layers of iron sandwiched between uh, plastic scintillators. And then it's, it's all cooled. When they have to have huge air conditioners just to keep it cool because it would overheat. <laughs> and this is in a, a mine area that's about 60 degrees naturally. Um, that's supposedly the, the deepest underground artwork uh, in existence. Oh, cool. So it is was on it, the neutrino. De- it's about the neutrino detector. Was it warm it, down there? Uh, it is warm in the detector room. So so in the mining area itself, you can actually take a tour of the the old mine itself, and that's about 55 degrees. 
So you can feel the yeah. heat of the earth. No, 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 no. It's in the mine area. It's fifty-five degrees, so it's cool. That's cool. Yeah, but so you can't feel the heat of the earth. Okay. Right here, the, the detector is the same level, so it's two thousand feet under. But because the detector generates so much heat, it, it would overheat the room really quickly. So they have these very loud, massive air conditioners to lower it down to about seventy degrees. Mm, okay. So yeah, so no. If you say fifty-five degrees to me, Brian, I'm just like I think that's really hot. Yeah, you got to you got to 70, 77, you're like yeah. you're on fire. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. No, 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 Fahrenheit. It, well, translate. If you tell me Fahrenheit, this is just gibberish to me. I don't understand. Okay. Um yeah. It's okay. It's all right. We'll move on. Um, yeah, I'm not right? sure what the conversion low teens. Is. Low teens? Yeah, low yeah. teens. Yeah. Now, how are they detecting neutrinos with that exactly? With that artwork? No, I mean with, uh, with the device. They, I mean They go through the uh, the neutrinos come through this uh, detector that has the scintillators, and they have fiber optics. So, so when the neutrinos strike the material, the fiber oh, optics detect the light off of that scattering, and and so that's how they detect where the neutrinos are. the The neutrinos are actually coming from Fermilab. So, oh. so basically, they're generating neutrinos at Fermilab uh, near Chicago, and then firing them towards Tower Sudan to detect them. Oh, interesting. So, so that they're looking at uh, neutrino oscillations. So muon neutrino oscillations is what they're trying to detect. Are, are these flashes you would see with the naked eye, or are they just like too high, too high speed to see? Or yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't see them with the naked yeah, eye. You would you'd see nothing. You've got to have really yeah. sensitive detectors. Okay. So you know that's that's about probably 20, 25, 30 feet, something like that across. Um, <laughs> oh. oh, this is a different detector. Um, this is not part of the um, scintillator. One of the things they have now is they're looking for dark matter. So they have another um, detector for dark matter, and you can't tour that because it looks really boring. It's it's much smaller, but this is one of the gallium uh, detectors that they have for dark matter. So they're trying to do direct observations of dark matter, and they found one or two interesting observations, but not enough to confirm Doc Manor. Um, there's a better shot of the of the actual neutrino detector. And uh, there's me in front of the artwork. That's what it is above it. That that's that's what northern Minnesota looks like. So this is a uh, probably about three miles from where the mine is. Nancy, so. is don't you have a, a cabin on a lake somewhere near there? Yep. Central <laughs> central Minnesota. So I just okay. came home from there. <laughs> that's awesome. So, yeah. That's pretty much what it looks so, like. So that's what it is. The, the, that's the nice thing part. about it is that you can actually tour it. They have tours twice a day. And um, anyone, it's open to the public. It costs Open to the public, okay. Right. Yeah, it, no, it is open I... to the public. Good. That sounds great. Uh, so you didn't do it on any scientific journey. You just said, hey, can I come see this thing? That's awesome. No, they have they have open tours. So anyway, okay, so yeah, I think we cool. got time for one more story, and so David, I'm going to kick this to you, which is the uh, discovery of a nova. Yeah, we've we've got a, an actual naked eye nova in the northern hemisphere skies Wednesday night. Uh, it always happens when I disconnect from the internet to go have supper that no sooner than I come back that there was an announcement that went around the internet that there was a bright nova in the constellation Delphinus, Delphinus the dolphin near the Summer Triangle, not far from the bright star Altair. And I got a look at it last night, and this is a classical nova. We get one of these every few years, but this one is actually fairly bright. Last night it was about fifth magnitude, which is about a magnitude brighter than, and, than dark sky naked eye magnitude, about six. And I've heard reports on the AABSO, the American Association of Variable Star Observers, today that was saying that it's right about magnitude 4, so it's actually getting a little bit brighter. So it's, a, it's definitely in binocular range, uh, in naked eye range, if you can... The only problem is we have the moon going toward full uh, on the 20th, so this weekend the moon is, is interfering a little bit. But uh, it's getting about as bright as the stars in the constellation Delphinus. So this one is it's technically named uh, Nova Delphini 2013. It's already got a designation. So. But uh, there was an awesome article in Universe Today. Bob King had that up within, I think he broke a land speed record getting that up there because no sooner than I had heard about it on Twitter, 
then I looked over there and there was a full article with like six graphics and videos and everything. I was like, wow, he, he got that up there really quick. He but, just came uh, back from vacation and saw that and yeah, he that was the first yeah. I heard about it when he said, Hey, I got this article for you and I so I awesome. was terrific. I was using that graphic and that article on my Kindle Fire out last night with my binoculars and using the graphic to kind of hold it up there and actually, like, his graphics are pretty good. And you found, so, and you were able to see it with your binoculars? Yeah, yeah oh, it, I just star hopped from the little diamond shape of Venus up there about a degree above it, and I estimated off, uh, I think it was 27 Vulpetulae near it at about fifth magnitude, and it, it seemed like it was a shade fainter than that. So I'd say last night it was point. 5.1, 5.2 magnitude. So, but they're saying now it jumped up to four. So, hopefully, we can get in the virtual star party Sunday night. Yeah, and we're gonna uh, have a uh, we're gonna have an article with uh, a bunch of pictures, images from people around the world that have taken images coming up this afternoon. So, yeah. uh, what's what's the distance from? Our I have not seen the distance. You know, I, I've queried uh, some some people on Twitter that may be in the know. I have not seen. It's right along the galactic plane, though. It's right along. Uh, the area through, uh, not quite Cygnus, but the area of Bulpetula and, and Delphinus. So okay. I have not seen a distance estimate on it. It, it just looks, but it, it's going to be interesting, especially if it stays bright after the moon moves out of the sky a little bit, because then, then it will be a little more prominent. Uh, so we haven't had one naked eye for a few years, so it's kind of cool. And a lot of people were out shooting per Perseid meteors, so the first thing I thought when I heard that is I started going through my images to see if I had caught it a day or two prior on all the images I shot. I didn't, but there's been a lot of cameras looking at the sky lately, so. Yeah. Let me know if you, f you hear the distance. Now, okay. now what was the cause of this Nova? Uh, anybody that, that's a, a PhD type could back me up this, uh, with a classical Nova. It's a, this is a, a, a star for, that's feeding matter onto a white dwarf, correct? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's then, then it's erupting off of that. Yeah, it's it's getting to uh, this hydrogen gas is, is adding itself. It's getting added to the top of this white dwarf, and that goes uh, through a very quick, fast nuclear explosion um, because too much mass has been dumped on. And so these things don't destroy d don't destroy the white dwarf or the star. And so the same object can have periodic novae. Um, right. So now is it piling up in one area, or is it like? like piling up like a ring around the star? Like I, I imagine this kind of pile of hydrogen just filling up in the, I don't know, in the sort of tidal area between the two objects. But is it is that what's going on? Or is it, like, is it just bulking up onto the star until it's, but it's like the I'm wrong sure. kind of hydrogen in the wrong place? Brian, do you, you know, like what it would actually, because when you see these pictures, you always see these, these two objects, you know, the white dwarf is feeding off the star, and mm -hmm. yeah, it's coming off I, into a disc. But I don't know if it's I, actually. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it's localized. I've seen some articles erroneously call this a supernova. This is just a standard classical nova. Yeah, it's so. a standard it's nova. just a baby nova. It's, it's within our it's within our galaxy. This isn't like a now if we if we had a supernova in our galaxy, that would be very exciting. We haven't but, had one of those for a while. Maybe but isn't that the future of this? Like it hits 1.4 times the mass of the sun and turns into a type 1A? No, because it is because it is giving off that extra bit right. through periodic novae. It's not going to go supernova. I think it's kind of one or the other. Right. Yeah. I am going to go look for it. I'm very excited. <laughs> yeah, we have yeah. clear skies here tonight, hopefully. So, hopefully I can see yeah, it. It's, uh, if, if you're familiar with Delphinus in that area, it'll, it'll look kind of cool to see it with an extra star, basically. Yeah. It's what it will look like. I mean, it's a nice high-up constellation in the summer, so it's going to be a really easy constellation mm -hmm. to see. Anybody in the northern hemisphere should be able to see it. Yeah. And it looks like a little dolphin. It absolutely does. It does. So yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, well, let's put that on the list on on Sunday night and see if we can we can pick it up. Yeah. That sounds great. Yeah. And speaking of um, exploding things and the Perseids, uh, I just wanted oh, to mention yeah. that we have a a great video that someone sent us that he actually captured um, a, that was know, cool. a persistent train and then the actual spread of the material. of. So uh, let me put the link here. I don't know if you can share it, somebody. But anyway, that's it's it's really cool. That. You know, it's it's I, a it's I, a it's a time lapse. So you um, you're seeing what happens over a period of 20 minutes in just yeah, a couple of it's, seconds. It's, it's really cool. It's like a expanding cloud of yeah, like a smoke debris. train. Yeah, yeah. I, I, reviewed, I reviewed that several times when you sent that to me last night, kind of looking at it. Like, That's kind of a cool catch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can share it. 
So I've put all the links uh, as we've been talking as comments on the event page. Um, so you can check that out. Uh, I can't do that on the YouTube page, but Fraser, if you want to pick up the links later... Um, is this working? Uh, can you guys see the... Is this actually yes. coming through? Yep. yep. Oh. <laughs> Weak the wheel. There. Okay, it, it, the second part of the video will, um, he'll, he, there oh, it is, you see it? Hey. The second part of the video, he zooms in, so. Sweet. You can, you can see the sun rising due to, that's what the glare is. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I was looking at the star patterns, too, to make sure he had the star patterns, right? We were trying to see if, if it was authentic or not. It's like, yeah, I see Perseus over there to the upper right, so. <laughs> Look at that. Right. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations, Michael Chung. That is astounding. I yeah. never get meteors like that when I'm shooting. I get one where it's like you got to squint, and it's like I think there's a meteor in the corner. That I never get bright meteors in my shots. Well, I had three. I I did the time lapse on the night before the press on Saturday night, and I got three meters go through my field of view. But I had made a mistake with the way I set up my camera that it was taking. Uh, I had the uh, the noise reduction. Reduction, the noise reduction yeah, yeah, yeah. built into it, and so it takes an image, and then it takes a dark frame for the same amount of time, and then combines it together to try and give you a less noisy image. And so I was taking 20 second exposures, and then it was taking a 20 second dark frame, which it turns out I shouldn't have been doing. My so, Nikon does that; it, it'll eat stars if you're not careful. If yeah, and so I should have. It should have been going 20, you know, yeah. picture, 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 but it was going picture, dark, picture, dark, and so all the meters that went through my my frame happened during the the dark time when it was when it was taking the dark, so I lost all the meteors, so, so I've I like, learned that mistake. Thanks to Corey Schmitz for setting me straight on that. I like the video you posted, and you said you were looking for Perseids, and all you got was some space station. Yeah, well, the space station <laughs> yeah, just went that. right through my field of view perfectly. It was great, except I did a bad job of taking an image of it, so I've learned that mistake. Uh, next time, I'm going to, you know, I'll be like Terry Legault, and I'll get images of it going through the sun and going in front of other <laughs> spacecraft and all kinds of crazy stuff. Okay, cool. Well, this has been great. Thanks, for everyone, for joining us on this awesome uh, weekly space hangout. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, so uh, before we go, let's give people a chance to talk about things they're working on and where we can find out more. So, Brian, now, when you joined us two weeks ago, you had a Kickstarter in the works. So you've still got a little more time left yeah. in your Kickstarter, right? Yep, until tomorrow evening. Uh, it's a Kickstarter called Prove Your World. We're doing science videos for kids. Uh, if you can kick in a few bucks, that would be awesome. So do a search for Prove Your World and uh, join in on the Kickstarter. And it's not much, and I think it's a great uh, project. So everyone do it. Uh, but otherwise, we can find, and as I mentioned last time, you know, you do this great blogging on uh, just on Google+. Plus. I mean, alone is a great blog platform for you. So I highly recommend, if you haven't already circled Brian, do it immediately and then enjoy all the stuff that he's been writing on Google+. Plus. Where else do we find out about you on the on the internet? Obviously, you, the Twitters. Yeah, I'm on Twitter. Uh, Twitter and Google+, Plus are basically my main platforms right now. And I'm still figuring out Twitter, so. Yeah, yeah that, that might take you a lifetime. Uh, <laughs> all right, David, where do we find out more? I'm active this week on Universe Today and Listasaur and my own blog, Astro Guys with a Z, and I will be at the Maven Conference next week, next weekend. That's right, 23rd at Boulder. So I'll probably be actually out of the space hangout for next Friday, but I'll probably be writing more about Maven. I want to try to make the Maven launch, too, in November. That'd be kind of cool. Oh, yeah, that would be amazing. Good, good launch here from KSC for a while, so yeah. that's great. Nancy Atkinson, where do we find out more? Universe Today, uh, every day. And uh, also Twitter, Nancy underscore A, and I'm on Google+. Plus. Fabulous. Uh, and Nicole. Hi. So uh, I am online as Noisy Astronomer, Google+, Plus Twitter, website. Uh, I work for CosmoQuest, so CosmoQuest.org. You can do citizen science with us. We have blogs, Twitter, education, materials, all kinds of cool things. Uh, and uh, I want to remind you guys, if you are in the Atlanta area or going to be in the Atlanta area for Dragon Con, uh, there is a star party the night before, Thursday night. So if you go to atlantastarparty.com, you can check out tickets to see uh, me, Pamela Gay, Phil Plate, uh, Derek Demeter. Uh, we'll be talking about astronomy. I have a really cool demo planned that I already practiced yesterday. Uh, so uh, check that out, and I hope to see you there. Hope to see you guys at Dragon Con. I won't be there this year because I'm going to be at I'm going to be at Fantastic. PAX. 
<laughs> so I've been to Dragon Con like three years in a row, and uh, I've really wanted to go to PAX, which is the Penny Arcade Expo, and they always happen on the same yep. on the same weekend. Yeah, so so I had to pick, and this this one the kids really want to go to. So I think we're gonna have a really good time going to PAX. So if anyone's going to PAX, then drop me a note, and then we can definitely uh, get together and have dinner. Um, cool. Okay. So uh, now, Nicole, you had a something, an advertisement. You had a, a mention that we. Uh, I think to... we're going to do that next week. Do so do that I next give week? the person time to know that we're doing it. But uh, okay. now that if you sponsor 365 Days of Astronomy, uh, you can also choose to sponsor a hangout instead of the podcast. So we'll read it live on the hangout. Uh, that's just cosmoquest.org/blog/slash 365 Days of Astronomy. Uh, so I'll do that next week on next week's show. Give great. give the give the guy time to <laughs> know it's coming. Okay, great. And then I encourage you, if you're watching this on YouTube, to subscribe to the channel, whichever you're, where, however you're watching this, make sure you subscribe so that you'll get all of the either the Universe Today goodness or the CosmoQuest goodness. It'll come straight into your streams, and you'll find out more. So definitely subscribe if you are watching this on YouTube. Uh, and that's it. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks everyone for watching. Thanks to the panel, and uh, we'll see everyone uh, next week. Woohoo!